Okay, thanks so much, Livio, for joining me here um, on my small YouTube channel. Uh, we have Livio Ramondelli. I'm very, very honored um, to have you here today, Livio. And uh, we are focusing this chat today on uh, your uh, recent book, The Kill Lock. I'm going to show um, a few pages much better than later on. But uh, I personally, uh, really loved it. And as I was telling you before our um, interview, um, I'm always uh, on the lookout for this type of hidden gems, like like the Kill Lock, um, where books where the quality is extremely high and uh, the there is some buzz, there is some excitement in the, in the industry, in the market, but not maybe as much as the bigger titles, the bigger names, uh, because this is really your labor of love, right? So um, if that's okay, Livio, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to maybe introduce the, the work for us. Sure, yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to, to talk to you. Um, yeah, so the Kill Lock was a passion project that I worked on around Transformers and the other stuff I was doing. You know, I was really interested in doing an original science fiction story about, you know, science fiction always been so good about taking human themes and just making them a little bit more far off so you can address them in a kind of more objective way, you know? So, you know, I think if you did this story with human characters, it would be a lot more kind of uncomfortable and less fun. But I think when you make them robots, you know, what the, the concept I liked was pairing four very different characters. You know, you have a very intelligent, but kind of psychotic engineer. You have a moral but kind of violent soldier you have a, an alcoholic laborer and then you have a very innocent unfinished kid all bound together by this punishment where if one of them dies they all die so that's the premise is these four characters have to work together to to stay alive and i i thought that was a really kind of interesting idea hopefully of you know pairing characters that would never normally interact in that way it's it's fantastic it works extremely well and um, and the uh... And also, the idea itself uh, gives the book a particular depth, uh, as we were saying, because it allows the characters to interact in a way that is uh, much more real, meaning that uh, almost like colleagues in a, in a business, you know, they have, to they, they have to cooperate. It's not like they want to, they feel they're nice people. No, they're not nice people. They're very flawed. But... Uh, the circumstances around them um, force them to go outside of themselves and, and make that make an effort to cooperate. And, and this is some this is the social aspect that I think gives this story, your story, such a depth that I haven't found very often in uh, in uh, similar stories or similar publications. That's that's my point. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, I was hoping to do a real kind of character story, you know, where it's a science fiction story, but I really wanted the personality and the emotion to come first. You know, it doesn't, I didn't want to get bogged down in the technology of how their world works so much as I really wanted it to be the personalities shine, you know, the most. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, I know that you've been uh, working on Transformers for uh, a long time. And, uh, and that's, could we say that's your background as an artist? I probably, I mean, that's the thing, that's the, the biggest thing I've worked on. That's probably what I'm most known for, you know, like I worked previously for Wildstorm, which is part of DC Comics, and I was a sort of concept artist there. And I've, you know, I've done a lot of conventions around the world, but Transformers is in terms of publication, that's the biggest thing I worked on. Yeah. And so, you know, with the, all the um, admiration for that franchise, uh, which is huge, it's gigantic all over the world, right? Yeah. Uh, I was actually reading that there is this uh, Transformers, uh, let's say, world, right? Because within the industry, Transformers is such a, a huge and strong franchise that there are meetings and conventions. And, and like you say, you guys meet around the world. Yeah, I mean, that's that was the incredible thing about it for me was, um, you know, it, it really is kind of a, in a way, it's an isolated fan base. A lot of Transformers fans really just focus on Transformers. But I was surprised that there are, you know, specific Transformers conventions around the world in a way that there's not like a Spider-Man convention, you know, but Transformers, like there's quite a few of those, you know, whereas like even something like X-Men or Batman, you don't quite have like a Batman con somewhere, you know, but Transformers, you do find that in a lot of countries. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and 
<clears throat> from my point of view of somebody, and I'm saying that because uh, generally on, on the conversations that I have on, on this YouTube channel are more about books and literature. So from my point of view, um, I see your work as something that uh, uh, takes some elements of that type of science fiction of Transformers, but honestly really elevates it to oh. a level that um, maybe has, it might have a little bit less mass appeal because uh, depth, you know, and, and, and really high quality sometimes is not what the masses want to consume. Yeah. But, uh, but it, it, I, I found here uh, what we could call something like um, real literary uh, qualities. You know, like, like a work of literature, like uh, we're, we're chatting before, a work by Alan Moore, something that goes beyond the simple, um, the simple good versus evil and uh, thinking about the big blockbuster movie of Transformers with all the good that they have. Yeah. You know, there is a simplicity about them that, that your book doesn't have. Your book is, is, is in fact, if, even if the premise might sound a little simple, it's a very complex book. It's a very, very complex book. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, I think like um, like I really am interested in morally gray characters too. You know, so you can see sort of a natural evolution with you know. I grew up as a, obviously a Transformers fan before I worked on it. So Optimus Prime, for example, this kind of noble soldier, you can see a bit of that with the Wraith character in the Killlock, where he's a noble soldier. But what would that be if you took it a little farther and you show the real kind of violence of that world? You know, so I kind of like going back to Alan Moore with Watchmen, where it's like you have these archetypes like Rorschach as kind of Batman, a little bit more unhinged, you know? And I think the good thing about creating new characters is you can explore them a little more fully, you know, where you deal with Optimus Prime or Spider-Man, the company that's created those characters really wants to keep them a certain way, you know? They're not, you don't really have the freedom to do whatever you want with them. But if you create your own world like this, you can do whatever you want. It, and that's exactly the point. So you said it better than I did. You know, you basically, by working on your labor of love independently, you were able to expand the palette to infinity and say, okay, I want to put the depth and the darkness and flaws and uh, all the different angles that sometimes are difficult to input in, in a work that has visibility of, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but, but then the flip side of that is that my preference would be for a work like this to have <laughs> more, <laughs> more viewers and more, uh, more fans. Um, so that kind of is a good segue for my, my next question, which is, it's so cool. You've been uh, traveling around the world. I've seen other videos where you've been interviewed about uh, conferences in Singapore, conferences in Asia, in Europe. And uh, so number one, how is that experience, right? Because uh, as an artist, you might, see the different reactions of wherever you go so personally right but also from the medium point of view i'm curious to ask you uh, how do you see the perception of comic books differs from uh, region to region or maybe even from country to country it's a good question yeah um it's been wonderful to travel that way like i never thought you know growing up drawing in a corner that i get to travel the world professionally to do that you know that's that's been a really great thing about this this career has been getting to see the world you know um yeah it's it's funny too because like i've traveled a good bit of the world at this point and people's preferences they're not as different as you might think you know i think the most popular characters are, are sort of universally the most popular like there are differences for example like uh japan is one of my favorite places to travel and when you go to japan uh, yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with Attack on Titan. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a movie and a, it's based on a manga. Yeah. But I saw more uh, marketing for that than anything else in all of Tokyo. Like I saw more for that than a Marvel movie. I mean, it was like, that was interesting to see, you know? And then, and then in Singapore, I remember being on the subway and seeing everyone, you know, read, or not everybody, but quite a few people reading not just a comic on their phone, but the same comic. There was like a daily comic that everyone oh, wow. saw which was great. I mean, that's something I really wish was existed in the United States, that there was this kind of ritual, the way that you get your morning news, everyone like sees CNN or whatever, but that would be really cool if that was part of your daily, oh, on the commute to work, we read the new update, you know? So there's things like that that are really interesting. 
Um, and then, you know, cosplay, like the dressing up aspect, that that is universal, you know, like, yeah, it's it's really, it's pretty incredible though. Like, I mean, the fact that certain characters really resonate in so many different countries is is really yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> that example about Singapore is fascinating because um, it also has to do a lot with the, this, uh, um, let's say, cultural perception. And, uh, um, and it, I noticed a little bit of difference coming from Italy between Europe and the US, but there still is in, in both places, let, let's call it in the West, this uh, um, level of uh, um, lack of appreciation of uh, the full potential of the sequential art of, of comic books. And not obviously not from everyone, but from uh, uh, some uh, groups or, or readers or people who would appreciate a really smart, deep and high quality comic, uh, but they don't come near the medium because of a certain cultural stereotype that the comic book or the graphic novel um, does not offer you that type of uh, experience, right? Well, yeah. well, not only it does, well, you know, like this is a perfect proof of that, but uh, it, it, it does sometimes in ways that are more powerful than the written word in a, in a novel. Obviously, there is a, a big difference, uh, but this idea and this type of open-mindedness is not always, always understood, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I agree a lot. Comics have this great potential because for just sheer budget reasons, you can do whatever you want in a comic, you know, like in a movie, you're, you're constrained by CGI or how much, how many extras you can afford. But in a comic, it's like, like Killick's a good example. It's like, that's an all, you know, robot cast, a very, they go to planet after planet. I mean, you, really your budget is whatever you want to draw, you know? And, and that's, that's incredible because there's not a lot of mediums that are like that, you know, comics and novels really are, are the two. I, I love that. I love, I would love, let's say more people to understand this position of uh, the comic art in uh, in between books and novels and uh, movies on the other side uh, we clearly understand they're all very different but you know compared to a novel the comic book if it has a really great artist like you behind it it can uh, hit your senses your visual senses your your eyeball in a way that obviously prose cannot do um, and on the other side, towards the movie side, like you say, there is this uh, sense of unlimited um, fantasy, unlimited imagination, which even with all the CGI that we have today, um, there are still limits in producing a movie and in showing everything that uh, a producer would like to show, right? So the comic doesn't have that, that limitation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's so true. Yeah. The only, the only limits that comics really have are sometimes, and even on the Killock, this was the case of, you know, you always have things you want to include, but they have to fit within a certain number of pages, you know? And then the, the big thing I wrestle with too, is if you want a surprise to happen in a comic, it has to happen on an even number page, you know, because you have to flip, you know, whereas a mm -hmm. movie, you really control what people see at every, at every moment, you know, like Frank Miller was talking about how, you know, comic books, you can read a comic in two seconds if you blast through it. You know, there's there's tricks he's learned over the years of slowing down the pacing, you know, and getting someone to take their time reading it, you know, because you want it to be a memorable experience. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. yeah I think great, that is a great point. I mean, not only from the creator point of view, but uh, the reader. As a reader, um, you, you you need to approach uh, a comic, especially I would say anybody who would read the, the Kill Lock. I, and I realized this uh, maybe from the first five pages, you know, when I started, that this is a book that you need to read carefully because there is a lot that you miss if you just breeze through it. Oh, good. Uh, there, there are many details that I probably even didn't catch all of them, but I realized there's a lot of stuff like that, uh, little little nuances, um, and then you, uh, in a very kind of original way, published a few YouTube videos where you do the comment of, um, uh, of some of each issue, right? And, and listening to that, I realized, oh, 
actually that sense that I had was true. Okay. There is a, a creative mind behind this that was very, very careful about the details and, uh, and, and you know, and not just uh, thinking about the story in, in a fast, fast way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that was that was very intentional. You know, I worked on this for a long time and really thought about like the little little character moments, you know, and I really hoped that that would kind of come through. That's uh, that's incredible, um, especially because especially because in, in uh, uh, <clears throat> thinking about people like Alan Moore and uh, Frank Miller, great authors, um, you know, you run the risk of uh, missing out, missing out on really great quality art that otherwise, uh, you know, is forgotten because is in, in that particular uh, ship. But, but to your point, you say, yes, there is the limitation of the, the number of pages and, and the shape. The reader of a comic book has to be a little bit active, okay? In, if you put it on a on a scale, you start from a movie, and the what if you watch a movie, you can be almost like a you know, on your uh, uh, like a vegetable and just uh, passively <laughs> and yeah. enjoy everything without really being actively involved. Um, you have a book or a novel, uh, and you always have to work with the with the author with the writer to create that experience. And that's why it takes a little bit maybe more mental energy to read a book by Dostoevsky than uh, to watch a movie, right? Yeah. Uh, with the comic book, I think we are, again, on the side of the, of the book on the enhanced mental energy because your imagination has to fill for in between each panel with, with, with that uh, whatever is not shown on the page. So you have to work a little bit with the creator. And once you get into that loop in that game, um, you really realize that the huge potential, it's that, that which, which has no limits, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I really like about comics is that, you know, you can read it on a surface level. You can appreciate the story and the art, but then there's little details along the way or things on a second read that make, you know, like there's, there's a couple of things in the kill lock where, once you finish the entire story and you go back, there's things that are in there that you'll only get on a second reading, you know, and I, I like putting those things in there. I think it, it enriches this experience a lot. Yeah. Um, so the, the concept is a, a really, really strong one. This uh, uh, flawed characters are linked against their will and uh, completely, uh, and even, you know, like you say, there is maybe a certain darkness about their, their um, it's not, we're not only talking about imperfect personalities, but you push it a little bit farther than just imperfect. They are kind of flawed, right? Really deeply flawed. Um, and then there is uh, one of the four characters who represents uh, more innocence and, and purity. Um, there is a lot of humor. I love the sense of humor all throughout, which is not easy to, you know, insert while doing everything else that you're doing as a as a comic author, artist, and writer. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, uh, in general, you know, the process? I understand you've been working on this uh, on the side in your own private time while you were doing other other works, but uh, how difficult is it to, for example, you are the writer and the artist. Have you been writing the script separately? How, how did they come together? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the first thing was the just central premise that I knew I wanted these characters from different parts of society to be locked together. But even that was like, how many should be locked together? You know, should it be three of them, six of them? Like, so I settled eventually on four because I thought that was an interesting dynamic where, you know, the two or three feels like, oh, we could probably get along. When you when you do four characters, you're like, oh God, there's going to be some like conflict. Guaranteed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like a natural kind of like, you know, the three can out, you know, outvote the, the, the remaining one, that kind of thing. From there, it was like, it was writing the personalities and then coming up with the visual later. I knew I wanted a lot of contrast, you know. Um, and then with the humor, that was a, that's a good point as well. Like, what I liked about having like the artisan character who kind of makes fun of the proceedings and is he almost breaks the fourth wall in the way he talks. 
I, I like a character like that because he, he, by him making fun of things, you can have another character like the Wraith be completely serious, you know, and everything no, about that. Zero sense of you, zero, zero irony. Sense humor. Yeah, <laughs> zero. And then he's also the most, the most traditional science fiction archetype of like this soldier, you know, he, everything about that character is very kind of fantastical. Whereas the artisan speaks in a much more human way. And so I thought that dynamic was, was interesting to me because you know, I, I liked that you could have all the serious science fiction elements that I like, and then also have a character that makes fun of the world they're in, you know? So that was the, the goal, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's an incredible chemistry between these four personalities you you created because they, they really go together. I, I would say, especially now that you mentioned, especially these two characters, the, the psychopath and the noble knight, uh, because they're such um, polar opposites and they are naturally built to, to have a conflict just in their nature. One doesn't take anything seriously. The other one takes everything seriously. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it just works really, really, really well. well thank you. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Then let's say from the design point of view, I would imagine that as a, as a creator, you would have a lot of it in mind before going to the page and drawing but do you also did you also um, have a proper let's say proper script um, that you prepared for yourself how, how did you work on that yeah that's another good question I, I did I I sort of do the script and the layouts at the same time so I'm visually plotting out the page so the script that I write for myself doesn't say you know panel page 12 panel one but it will say the dialogue and then with the dialogue i'll do the layouts at the same time because ironically like, like unlike transformers where generally someone else is writing that you have to do layouts to send to the editor and the writer but with uh, the kill lock i'm the only one that ever sees the layout stage because it's really me writing and drawing and then there's the letterer but you know so the script on that was really a dialogue um process mixed with the layouts <coughs> excuse me so yeah, yeah. That was the that's impressive, really impressive, because there's a, you know, I, I'm thinking your average, um, your average uh, comic book or graphic novel is generally a teamwork, right? You have a lot of people uh, coming together and uh, uh, even if there is maybe one driver or, or one leader. And uh, in this case, uh, as I was mentioning uh, before, you have really complete control and I think the reader feels it. The reader feels the consistent, the, co the coherent work, the consistency, the, the single voice comes uh, comes through. Um, obviously, on the other hand, is that on the disadvantage maybe is that it takes so much work <laughs> on, your, on your end, right? And uh, yeah, I don't know how how feasible it would be to to kind of produce. Uh, a lot of this type of works at, at, at this level and uh, because the market is what it is we, you need to uh, work with it right um, yeah. I'm talking as somebody who is external of the industry and I, and I don't even probably understand what I'm saying about it but don't you find that it's yeah. uh, there is a, a, a little bit of a conflict there not between yeah. producing by yourself and real high quality on one hand and, and then doing a little bit of slight compromises on the other. Yeah, no, that's absolutely, that's a great point. Um, the one problem comics do have compared to like a prose novel is if you're writing a scene in a prose novel and it's two characters going to like a cafe, all you have to do is d describe the cafe and then the reader imagines they're in a cafe for the rest of the scene. In a comic book, you have to visually show a cafe in every shot. <laughs> so that amount of every work, angle. <laughs> every angle, every angle, you have to build out, even if it's not an important scene, you have to build out the environment. And with an original series like Kill Lock, also when you're making it, you don't know if there's going to even be an audience for it, you know, because it's original characters and like the sense of humor that you find funny, you hope there's going to be people out there. So that's why it's so nice to, to talk to you and people that responded to, because like you work on something like this in a vacuum and you don't know if people are going to respond to it. So I think the notion of doing more of it now makes it feels a lot more real, you know, because there was an audience for it and thankfully it got a nice response. But yeah, when you're making it, you have no idea if a story is going to connect with people. 
Well, there's a, you know, there's a lot to be said about, uh, um, let's say, <clears throat> the, the difficulty of, uh, um, of getting on because it, like I, I told you, I was walking around in the bookstore and I found it. And I think by now I have a certain sixth sense for really good works like, like this one. But uh, like me, there are many readers out there who would absolutely love to read it. Um, but even if they go, let's say on Google and say top uh, 10 graphic novels of the last uh, couple of years, they always will get the same 10 titles. Yeah. They're, they're always, it doesn't mean they're, they're bad. They have their own merits, but I don't think they're gonna, they're gonna find it with a simple search or a simple internet query, right? Yeah, it's, it's hard these days. I mean, that's a problem that all, all media has is that there's so much content right now. You know, like if you go on Netflix or whatever, and you see the amount of TV shows and movies that are made. It's, it's different than it was years ago where something that was really high quality will be, will be seen a lot. You know, I, I do think that happens, but it takes more time. You know, I think the word of mouth buzz is really what, what helps. But I mean, there truly is just so much content. I mean, there's even independent comic books, there's so many creator-owned things being made right now, which is which is great. The fact that you can get your stuff out there, but it's also it's harder to be seen by things, you know. And, and on this point, what do you think about uh, the appetite? You know, <clears throat> we all know that uh, uh, you know streamers like Netflix, they really have been putting out so much content to the detriment of quality. This is you know, I'm not saying anything new. Everybody knows that. And so what do you think about the appetite of uh, readers and viewers, but let's talk about readers in particular, for uh, something that, you know, is more literary, like we were saying before, something that has more layers, a bit more complexity, that asks you to read sl more slowly, more carefully. Um, do you think that's uh, there, but uh, the market doesn't facilitate it a lot? Or do you think that it's just not there? I, I think it depends. I mean, I, you know, superheroes have always sort of carried the industry. You know, there's a reason that Batman and Spider-Man are always consistently publicly like the top comics. But I do think that over time, if you make something of, you know, high quality, for example, like Preacher or like Why the Last Man, you know, it took a while, but eventually there was TV shows made of both of those things where like Preacher is a great example. Like it's a phenomenal comic book. And it, you know, there was so many years people have wanted to adapt that into movies or TV shows. And I do think it's, it, I think it is just that. I mean, that process is, is hard. I think, I think if you make something good, you will, you will find an audience for it, but it's just a question of how big the audience is going to be. And then also like, do you, do you keep feeding it? You know, if you do more of an independent story, are you helping the first series? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, is, yeah. is there, um, is there less maybe, <clears throat> let's say, appetite for the superhero type of comic book in other countries like Europe and Asia? Or, or like you were saying before, it's kind of well spread out and, and you don't see too many differences. It depends. I mean, I know I was talking to um, a comic book store owner. I went to Dubai for a convention. I talked to a comic book store owner who had a shop in Cairo. And he was saying that Batman was still his top seller. And it was oh, specifically, really? and it was specifically the same, same exact Batman stories here that, that are big in the United States. So there is that kind of thing. I mean, Japan is interesting because Japan has this gigantic manga market, you know, so they produce so much content there. Uh, it varies. I mean, I think that the movies really, like I've noticed that on Transformers is once there was the live action movies, that really made the brand larger in other countries. That that was an entry point for a lot of countries that didn't particularly read the comics or even play with the toys growing up, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, I think, I think it's that kind of stuff. It's like what, you know, just what movie theater, like Marvel, I think Mar Marvel is universally massive. The movies have really made it in such a gigantic brand. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> I, I agree with you. I agree with you on the fact that uh, if something, you know, is objectively really good, it will find an audience. There, there is no way it won't. Um, yeah. and, and I hope that the Kill Dog will find even more than what it's, it's found so far, because this actually was published uh, last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was published right before the pandemic. So, <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, yeah. uh, it's almost sounds like a test, you know, like, like uh, yeah. fate was, was almost testing you. 
But yeah. um, um, and so you mentioned the preacher as a as an example of another complex title that um, a lot of people realize the complexity of it and the quality. Would you have maybe another couple of titles to throw out? And uh, if you had to recommend, you know, um, other works uh, that you know recent or less recent the, that present the same type of uh, level of depth and and uh, and high quality. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you the the ones that you know it's it's not it's not stuff people haven't heard of, but um, yeah, Pre preacher, why the last man is saga. I really love saga. I mean, there's a reason those books are so revered. In in novels, I can say one big influence I had, like as trying to write something, was uh, Gillian Flynn, who wrote Gone Girl, and like her, like I, I really like her sense of writing, and it had a huge impact on me when I was trying to because she she does a great job of kind of morally gray or very questionable characters, but are still likable, you know? So I think when Gone Girl got made by David Fincher, that felt like a very natural collaboration because his movies also embrace that. And those two people are huge influences for me in terms of a storyteller. There's a lot of stuff in The Kill Lock, for example, that there's visual shots that very much are kind of influenced by learning like David Fincher's techniques of you know, you can just cut to a close-up of someone doing something with no words and you immediately get more of that character. Very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and, and what about your personal reading? You know, when you read for entertainment, um, do you read kind of 50-50 uh, books, novels, and, and comic books or majority comics? What's your taste? It, it depends. I mean, ironically, like when I got into comics professionally, I started reading less comics than I did before, which is not on purpose, but just kind of a funny thing. So these days I, I don't tend to buy a lot of new stuff. I'll reread older stuff, you know? Um, it depends. I mean, it, it really is just kind of like going back to the word of mouth thing. If, if a book or a comic gets recommended to me so much, that's what I'll, that's what I'll read, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, I certainly as a, as a reader and a fan, I, I'm hoping that uh, you will continue um, Kind of sneaking out projects like uh, the kill lock for sure um but in terms of your day-to-day -day, um work can i ask you what you're working on in these days yeah i can't unfortunately really talk about what I'm <laughs> it hasn't been announced publicly but yes uh, i will say that you know going back to traveling conventions are finally starting up again so i'll be on the east coast in a few weeks for New York Comic Con. So that'll be a big, you know, testing ground for the world recovering after the pandemic. So wonderful. Let's hope that that actually, you know, goes well and uh, and uh, the the entire let's call it circuit uh, uh, starts again like uh, like it should because I guess the industry is is feeding a lot from those from those uh, big conventions, right? And, yeah. Um, yeah. But and, and I'm also I'm also wondering about the connectivity between uh, you know given that you are based in Los Angeles, uh, you know, uh, is there any type of uh, uh, advantage in being here as a as a comic book creator for networking or knowing people who have been creating movies or TV shows based on comics or in today's world, everything is so global that it doesn't really matter too much anymore. That's a that's a really good question. Yeah, uh, there definitely is because when I became a freelancer on Transformers, I could have lived, I could choose to live anywhere. I was based in San Diego, and then I became full time freelance, and I chose to come to Los Angeles for that for that reason. Where just the people here, it, it's different than any other city I've ever seen. Where you do have that networking aspect and. And yeah, even though everything is kind of global now with, you know, you can talk over Zoom and email and stuff, it's, there is the in-person aspect, you know, they're, like, they're, I'm working with some people now where it's incredible to get to actually know them in person and work on projects, you know, where you do, it, there is definitely a different feel than just the kind of the, the virtual world, you know? So yeah, I mean, LA pre-pandemic was my favorite city I've ever lived in for that reason, or just the people and the kind of things you could do here for, for that yeah yeah well um <clears throat> you know i'm very much looking forward to uh hearing uh, some of the viewers of this uh, brief interview uh, if they um are uh, interested in uh, reading the kill look and their feedback about it because i'm here 
really strongly recommending it to anyone. Um, and it's uh, and we could say that it's not uh, it is it, not uh, it doesn't have an age uh, bracket for sure, but uh, we could say that it's more on the adult uh, side of the spectrum, right? Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I mean the, the the themes it deals with are pretty adult. Like I and also the morally gray aspect, you know, where like you know, it, there's not true, there's not really a traditional hero to root for. You know, the main cast is basically criminals. You know, and yeah. and, and then it's I, so, everyone, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I got to the end of the book thinking, how did he pull it off? How how do you make the reader root for for characters for this? No, I'm, they're not unlikable because in the end they are likable. But they're yeah. really different from your typical hero or, or, or typical. That's that takes a certain craft, and I'm sure it wasn't easy from from your side to write it. Yeah. Well, I talked to um my friend Dr. Dre Letamendi is a psychologist, and she did the psychological profiles that are in the the series. Oh, yeah. Yes. And and when I was beginning the series, I talked to her and I asked her because she has a podcast where she analyzes you know fictional characters and from a real psychological perspective and she said that with any character no matter who you're talking about the joker you know the, the worst the worst she looks at it as you know what happened to them and what do they want now and i was like that's a really great bit of framework to think of a character where in the kill lock you have like the artisan who's a very questionable sort of character but all you have to really do i think to get the reader to humanize them is just give them a bit of like perspective, like what was their life like? What are they, what are they looking to do? You know, and then suddenly you just understand them a lot more that it's not like this insane maniac. It's like, there's, there's a reason this character is this way, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and thank you for bringing this up. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. At the end of the book, you included this uh, psychological profiles for each of the main characters. Um, that wasn't uh, a, a su surprising to me because I realized the depth that is in, in this story, right? And this yeah. kind of proved me, okay, oh, all right, there was a lot of thought <laughs> that went into uh, yeah. creating these personalities. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, a part of this must be also the, the psychologist uh, view on a story that you've already written. So it's not like you know every single facet, you just write the story and then somebody can read different different aspects no yeah that was that was really interesting for me because i thought i knew these characters pretty well and there's even subtle things i put in that i was like no one's going to notice this little moment and dr letamendi when she did the profile she really picked up everything and even right. explained things further and i was like oh interesting because i did kind of feel like with some of the characters that you know i i had an idea for what they were and she was able to really call out like oh this is probably why this character is acting this way and i, I found it really fascinating that's interesting how, how did this happen that you, you got a psychologist to analyze your comic well we were we were friends already and i look i really appreciated her work where she she she's really good at not only obviously psychology in the real world but she understands storytelling and you don't always find someone that can do both of those things so i was like when I was planning out the kill like I wanted I wanted the characters to feel you know authentic because also there's themes like addiction you know the labor character there's like there's a character that has addiction so I wanted to portray that in a kind of a realistic way you know I didn't want this cartoon version of it and she was helpful with that for sure of like and also just like the idea of a soldier you know a noble soldier who's a killing machine she she helped kind of frame that stuff too so I I just yeah I really enjoyed that process a lot Oh, really excellent, really excellent. It's, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of, um, um, you know, the, the, the beautiful part of, uh, I guess, being a creator is also, the, like you said, the fact that you're not completely, completely aware of what is, <laughs> what is going on, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you, you put it out there and then there is, there is some reading that people can, can do um, that can surprise you sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think even like the characters for me, you know, when I began the series, it was like finding their, their voice of who they were, you know, by the end of it, it was really obvious to me. I could just put them in a scene and they, like, you hear that story a lot with writers where it's like, oh, by the end, the character just tells me what he would say, you know, it, it and that, that felt like it to me too. It felt a lot more effortless to write them at the end of the series compared to the beginning. How long did it take you from the very beginning, the first inception? 
Oh, until the end. God, I mean, it was probably like, it's a long process because it was also the fact that it was my first ever creator owned thing. So it was probably like a four year, you know, working around transformers and everything. Now I think I could do something a lot quicker because I learned so much on this series. I mean, there's even, there's even things that seem so obvious now that I didn't know initially, you know, I remember like one that I still was kicking myself for is one of my favorite parts of the series is the first time you see the Wraith and, you know, he stands up and you see the massive size and everything. And in the initial version, it was like, he was just sitting around with them. There was no reveal. There was nothing dramatic. And I was like, that's such a stupid choice. You know, I can't believe I even thought of doing it that way. But at the time I was like, well, I, it, it's just so funny that some of the obvious storytelling stuff just, it comes to you later with more experience, you know? Well, and, and it's all things that you have to figure out by yourself. You know, you don't have advisors, you don't have, and so that's, that's the near impossible task from, from my point of view. So kudos, yeah. you know, for, for really pulling it off. It's, uh, like, yeah, it's wonderful. And so I guess, you know, is it recent enough that you're going to also uh, present it in, at the conferences that you're going into the East Coast and in the future? Yeah, I mean, that was one one of many unfortunate things about the pandemic was I didn't get to see in-person feedback from people. Right. You know? So like I got a lot of email and Twitter and stuff like that. But, you know, I think one issue, two issues maybe at most had been out and then the pandemic shut everything down. So now it would be really interesting to see, you know, in-person responses. And I've had people, one thing that's been wonderful is a lot of fan art has been made. People have sent me fan art of the characters that I've loved. So hopefully I'll get to meet some of those people that were that were drawing it. So, you know, there is a series uh, that you very probably know already uh, that's called uh, Love, Death, and Robots. Yeah, uh, on Netflix. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. An animated shorts that are really um, very artistic and very, you know, well crafted. And uh, in that type of context, in that type of, uh, um, I would see the kill lock, or maybe one part of the kill lock because it's a, it's a long story. Uh, yeah. come to life as an animated as an animated film that would be so so fantastic yeah yeah part of me when that premiered i felt a little jealous because i was like oh this feels so close to right. what I'm, you know <laughs> like I, I i did feel like that but i mean that's inevitable like i there's always going to be something that feels similar to what you're you're working on but but yeah of course i would love to see it adapted yeah yeah because to be honest um when the first series of that love death and Rubble came out um i was it was extremely good and uh, um, everybody said that it had incredible reviews the second one it was more a little bit hit and miss compared at least compared to the first one and and so i'm saying look there is this content that's already here it's ready <laughs> if, yeah. if anyone wants to animate it you know you don't have to do a lot of work yeah um that that would be great you know as, as yeah i would love it yeah yeah so that's uh, that's all I had. Thanks so much, uh, Lidio. I'm uh, uh, going to uh, you know put all the links that, that we need, but also during our uh, chat, I'm going to also show um, some pages from from the book so that uh, viewers can actually understand what what we are talking about. And uh, and a huge thank you, thank you so much for being available and uh, and uh, chatting with us about this uh, this incredible work. Yeah, no, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate it.